Good day, and welcome to another episode of Masonic Curators. Now, again, if you don't know my name, just watch some of our past episodes, you'll get it. Today, something rather interesting, because not everything as Masons that we look at hits us as a historical piece. And that many of you are probably tired of, at least me saying, that we all stand in our little security boxes when we go to Lodge, not really seeing Masonic history through open eyes? Well, here is a piece that 99% of you will say a candidate's uniform. Historically, you know, you're wasting my time. And most of you are probably going to hit the off button right now. Now, Right Worshipful Eddie Savage and I did a short piece uh, when we visited uh, Craybog Lodge that was meeting in Warren, Massachusetts. And at the end of the episode, we did a little history thing with a Knight Templar triangular apron and a candidate uniform. Now, Ed was nice enough to donate three uniforms to Masonic Curators for this episode. Um, I held up the triangular uh, apron and said, this is historical. I didn't coach Ed, and Ed hit the nail right on the head. And he said, the candidate uniform was also historical. Now, for many of us, we don't think like that. Now, we don't think of all the people who have worn these outfits over the years. All the Masons that have become members of our Lodge. Now, jurisdiction is different from jurisdiction. Lodge is different from Lodges. Lodge from one country is different from Lodges of other country. They may wear Canada uniforms. They may not wear full uniforms. Things are different. But... Think of all the men who, from your lodge who may have worn an outfit like this that would make it historical. A military personnel, veteran, a movie star, sports, civic, religious, political men, or members of your lodge who were pillars in the community. Just like you, they wore a white uniform coming into lodge. Now, I've seen old ones and I've seen new ones. I've seen ones that I'll show you in a second, buttons, others with ties. Uh, some of the lodges today are going to the new style hospital style um, white uniform with short sleeves. Uh, the color white does have a representation uh, to it. And of course, there'll be a lot of people out there saying, well, no, it means this, it means that, whatever. White, for the most part, means purity, and not purity of the individual. Purity of his heart, his conscious, his mind, when entering a lodge to take his degrees. Um, it, it, one of the meanings means that he, he leaves his outside world outside as he enters, takes everything off, puts on a white uniform. He is equal with Everyone else, it doesn't matter if the other candidate is a billionaire and he is just a sweet sweeper. They are all equal in the large room. And that's one of the things what the white uniform represents. All the candidates are equal. All the members are equal. It also signifies that he should have an open heart, mind, and consciousness when he receives the important and dignified degrees with an open heart and open mind. That is one meaning. Now, <clears throat> these outfits do have the historical society to them, and basically you will find that out once you do some researching, again, there's that bad word, researching, of your lodge and find out who wears these. Now, historically, I consider these part of the lodge history. They're not worth anything. They'll be lucky if they're worth five bucks. But it's interesting to see that they also came in different styles. This is the typical uniform that a candidate wears today. Ties, pair of trousers, white with a tie in the front. Nothing fancy. Okay? That's a candidate uniform today. Then we also find ones, the jacket, that is actually buttons that he would wear 
This is a different style. Again, a little bit of a different historical look at it. If I can find the button, there we go. White buttons on the jacket. And then the last one is rather unusual. It is a tie jacket, just like this. But the interesting note, which I haven't seen many, I have seen some, but not many, is that if I could figure out how the jacket works, that it has a pocket right here on the front. You don't find too many of them with pockets. Why would a candidate uniform have a pocket? It's not like he's going to carry his smokes with him, but more than likely maybe his eyeglasses with them. Those are permitted into the lodge. The other interesting fact is the trousers that go with this jacket. I have seen these with the ties to the side, and this is a rather heavy cloth material, but the interesting note does have the emergency flap. Of course, us guys need the emergency flap on it, but I've never seen this before. This one actually has pockets on the trousers. Now, why would a candidate's uniform need uh, pockets on the trout? No idea. But again, different uniforms, different eras, different lodges. <clears throat> and I'm going to show you in a second just how historical these pieces are. Now, take, for instance, this uniform. <clears throat> no, this is not a child's outfit. This is a Masonic candidate's uniform. Now, this actually is in the archives of the lodge. They keep it in an archival box. It dates to 1889. This uniform, or candidate's outfit, is the pants, okay? And there's the jacket, and I don't want to touch too much of it. As you can see, I am wearing white gloves, so I don't get my oily hands on here. <clears throat> this was worn by Brother Reuben Steer, who was born in 1838. Now, some of you are saying, no, a little person. What? Did you think General Tom Thumb was the only little person who was made a mason in Freemasonry? Again, do some research. He wasn't. Now, Reuben was only 49 inches tall, and though of that size, he had a full life. At one time, he owned a variety store here in town, and later he joined the Lily Putin Opera Company. Now, they have a very nice write-up on about Reuben Steer here in the lodge. You can't find much of information about him online, unfortunately. But as a member of the opera company, he traveled up and down the East Coast for years. He was nicknamed the Colonel, which that name stuck with him for the rest of his life. He petitioned French, uh, Friendship Lodge, but he was blackballed. But the nice thing was he was encouraged not to give up. The next time he was back in town to reapply again. He went on tour again with the company, and at that time, it was a doctor who was master of the lodge. He wrote to the Grand Master and informed the Grand Master of the circumstances stemming around Reuben Steer, that some of the brethren felt that because Reuben was only 49 inches tall, he wasn't man enough to be made a mason. Grand Master wrote back, and I thought his words were very fitting. He wrote back and said, well, if he is a pure heart and mind and a good man, that he didn't see a problem about him becoming a mason. Well, Reuben did return uh, from tour in the opera company, reapplied to the lodge. That letter was read to the lodge, and upon the ballot, it was clear. And Reuben was made a mason in Friendship Lodge Number 7 in 1889, of which this candidate uniform was custom-made for him and is now in the Lodge archives. Not only was he raised and made a member here, he served a number of years as Tyler for this Lodge. Now imagine coming up the stairs here and finding a 49-inch tall man with a sword in his hand as Tyler. 
That must have been one hell of a sight to see as a visitor. After which, uh, touring, uh, he did marry while I was on tour to another uh, little person. I believe her name was Rebecca. Uh, they opened a confectionery store right next door to the lodge room. That building doesn't exist anymore, but we will have a photograph of it. Uh, next door to the lodge room. And another interesting fact that I find very <laughs> interesting myself is that he was the truant officer for the town school department. Uh, Reuben passed away in 1915, but his memory still continues here today in Friendship Lodge. And I think this is a wonderful story that the Lodge has kept over the years. And it's one of those unusual stories that you don't find too often told in Freemasonry. So for those who think that Tom Thumb was the only little person, we now have Reuben Steer as well. So with that, I can't thank the uh, master and members here at Friendship Lodge Number 7 for giving us the opportunity uh, to do uh, a segment on this piece and all the other great artifacts and history we've seen and done and talked about. Follow us on Facebook. Don't forget, if you like what you see, give us a thumbs up. And with that, thank you very much. Good day.